द स्टोरीज ऑफ महाभारत रिटोल्ड बाय सुदीप्त भौमिक वेलकम डियर फ्रेंड्स टू नदर एपिसोड ऑफ द महाभारत आई होप यू आर एंजॉइंग देम इन द लास्ट एपिसोड वी हर्ड अबाउट द स्टोरी ऑफ हाउ द पांडवज एंड द कौरव ब्रदर्स found their guru their arms teacher in dronacharya and we also heard the story of ekalavya and his sacrifice and this episode we'll learn more about the training of dronacharya to his students the pandavas and the kauravas time came when drona realized that the kuru princess have completed their training and now was the time to showcase their talents and demonstrate their skills he went to dhritarashtra and said o king i have taught the kuru princess all the skills of using the most advanced weapons and they have successfully completed their training if you kindly permit me i would now like to showcase their talents in various weaponry in front of the royal family as well as the citizens of hastinapur it will not only please the audience but will also carry a message to all the enemies of hastinapur that the kuru throne will be in capable hands for years to come tritarashtra was extremely pleased to hear this news he gladly granted drona his permission and said oh how i wish i could have seen this exhibition of my son's talents and skills drona you please go ahead with the arrangements for this grand exhibition i will watch the event through the eyes of my brother vidur with dhritarashtra's blessings drona had the royal architects build a huge arena stadium in the outskirts of the city it was a grand stadium the likeness of which was never built before the tiered seats of the stadium reached high into the sky the royal boxes were decorated with luxurious silk and jewels colorful flags fluttered on the top on the day of the event people from all over the country started to pour into the stadium from early in the morning later the royal family arrived from the kuru palace and took their seats in the royal box dhritarashtra was accompanied by vidur who kept on describing the grandeur of the stadium and the surroundings kunti was doing the same for gandhari who had her eyes tied shut in a permanent blindfold before the main event the brahmins walked in and performed the rituals and prayed for the blessings from the gods then arrived drona accompanied by his son ashwatthama his white beard and white silk robe billowed in the winds and the crowd erupted in a loud cheer tona raised his arm to calm them down he then sat down on his special seat on the sidelines and gestured the guards standing at the entrance the guards opened the door and through them entered the princess led by yudhishthir they were all dressed in gorgeous costumes jewelry ornate armors and helmets the entire stadium stood up to cheer the pandava and the kaurava brothers who walked in and stood at their marked positions soon the show started and the princes began to exhibit their prowess in different kinds of arms and weaponry sometimes in group formations sometimes individually they demonstrated their skills with spears bows and arrows swords and maces sometimes they galloped around the stadium on horseback sometimes they chased each other on roaring chariots and sometimes just on barefoot again and again the enthralled crowd broke into thunderous applause then drona called upon bhima and duryodhana to a mock fight with their favorite weapon the iron mace the two arch rivals faced each other 
growling and snarling like two fierce lions, and they broke into an all-out fight. The maces clashed against each other, making loud bangs and sparks flew all around the arena. The crowd went wild, and soon the stadium was divided into two groups, one supporting Bhima and the other Duryodhana. They cheered their favorite prince while hurling insults at the opponent. Soon the event ceased to be an exhibition match and turned into a bloody battle. Drona realized that things will soon go beyond control and he asked his son Ashwatthama to go and stop the battle. Ashwatthama stepped into the arena and somehow managed to break up the fight. The two brothers, although unhappy to prematurely conclude the battle, grudgingly went back to their seats and the Kuru senior sighed in relief. Next, Drona stood up and addressed the crowd. My dear citizens of Astinapur, now I present to you my favorite student and the best archer in the world, the third son of our late King Pandu, Arjuna. Arjuna stepped into the arena, bowed to his guru, to his elders, to the crowd, and then began displaying his skills with mystical weapons and archery. The crowd gasped when he created a huge fire in the stadium using Agni or fire missile and soon he doused the fire in a thunderous downpour using Varunastra or the water missile. Next he fired the Vayuastra or wind weapon and forceful winds blew through the stadium blowing off the turbans and other garments from the audience. Then he fired his Parvatastra or the mountain weapon and the huge mountain appeared in the stadium to quell the winds. One after another, Arjuna demonstrated his skills with a variety of weapons and each time the crowd exploded in thunderous applause to cheer their hero. Arjuna also demonstrated his skills in archery by hitting a variety of almost impossible targets. The city of Hastinapur realized that Drona's claim was not in vain. Arjuna is indeed the best archer and warrior in the world. Just at that moment, a bright and handsome young man entered the stadium through the gates and the entire stadium turned their eyes to him. Although the man was wearing simple clothes, but he wore a natural armor that was an integral part of his body. The bright and glowing earrings on him also seemed to be an integral part of his ears. He stepped into the arena and called out to Drona, O oh, great Guru, Dronacharya, I am Karna. I can prove to you that I am a better archer and a better warrior than your favorite student Arjuna. Whatever skills you demonstrated, I can perform them all even better. So please, permit me. There was such an air of confidence in his voice that it amazed the audience as well as Drona. His bold stance and his defiant attitude drew the attention of the entire stadium. The excited crowd started to cheer Karna and called upon him to display skills. Drona had to give in to this demand. But standing in the sidelines, Arjuna felt a tinge of jealousy creeping in him. He didn't like the glory he was enjoying being shifted towards this strange young man. Karna stepped into the center of the arena and started demonstrating his mastery with various weapons. He displayed the same feats shown by Arjuna and some even better than him. Soon the audience in the stadium realized that Karna was indeed a great warrior, someone who was worthy contender of Arjuna. They cheered Karna with huge applause as he concluded his demonstrations. The Pandavas, especially Arjuna, felt that the limelight has now shifted from them onto Karna. Duryodhana also realized that Karna could be the only person who can counter Arjuna in the battlefield and hence befriending him would be the best strategy. He immediately walked up to Karna and embraced him and said, Karna, you have amazed us with your skills. What can we, the Kurus, do for you? Tell me. Karna was overwhelmed with this kind gesture. He said, O oh, Prince, all I desire is your friendship. 
Arjuna was fuming with jealousy. And watching Duryodhana extend his hand in friendship to Karna made him even more angry. Duryodhana glanced at Arjuna and smiled. And Arjuna looked at him and growled in anger. Karna could sense this rivalry between the cousins. He took this opportunity and asked Duryodhana, O Prince Duryodhana, if you permit me, I have one more request. I want to challenge Arjuna in a duel, a single combat. According to the Kshatriya tradition, a warrior can never decline a challenge for a duel. Arjuna too was eager to fight Karna and end his arrogance once and for all. He picked up his weapons and stepped into the arena. Duryodhana took Karna to the center of the arena and the two rivals faced each other. The crowd went berserk. The stadium exploded with thunderous shouts, screams, roars and cries of the people. Everybody stood up on their feet to watch this unprecedented battle. But in the royal box, all of a sudden, Kunti felt dizzy. She fainted and fell off her seat. But to know the reason for a sudden illness, we need to go back to her past, when Kunti was only a teenager living in her father Kunti Bhoja's palace. In an earlier episode, I had mentioned that Kunti had a boon or a gift from Rishi Durbasha. Once, Rishi Durbasha had visited Kunti Bhoja's palace and was extremely pleased with Kunti's kindness and hospitality. The happy Rishi gave her a gift, a divine mantra, which when chanted gave her the power to invoke any god she wished and have the honor of bearing a child of him. Kunti was too young to really appreciate the seriousness of this boon. So one morning, while she was watching the sun rise in the eastern horizon, just out of sheer curiosity, she recited the mantra and invoked the sun god. And lo and behold, the sun god himself appeared before her in person. He said, Kunti, you called me. And here I am. I will give you the most beautiful child one can expect. Kunti was flabbergasted. Besides, she was merely a child, a teenager. She said, no, 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 I don't want a child. It was a mistake. Please go back. The sun god smiled and said, I cannot go back without fulfilling my task. The mantra obligates me to give you a child. You must accept me. The scared princess said, But, but I am not married. How can I have a child out of wedlock? Don't you worry, Kunti, said the sun god. Even if you have a child from me, you will still remain a virgin. And saying so, he embraced Kunti. In due course of time, Kunti gave birth to a beautiful little boy. The boy had a strange physical feature. He seemed to be wearing a hard armor on his chest and a pair of glowing earrings. But being an unmarried girl, Kunti didn't have the courage to keep the child. She put the young boy in a basket and set it afloat in the flowing waters of the river Ganges. And with tearful eyes, she came back to the palace, thinking she would never see her child again. The basket kept on floating down the river for miles till it reached the outskirts of Hastinapur. There, Adhirat, the royal charioteer, was taking a bath in the river. He saw the basket with a beautiful boy floating by. He picked up the child from the basket and brought him to his wife, who was ecstatic with joy to have a son. The childless couple thanked the gods for being so kind to them. They named the boy Karna. So the moment Karna stepped into the arena with his natural armor and earrings, Kunti knew that this man was none other than her firstborn child, the son of the sun god, whom she had abandoned in the river Ganges. She was overwhelmed with mixed emotions. On one hand, she was happy to see his son grown up to be a handsome young man. On the other hand, she felt saddened that she could never embrace him as a mother would. 
she tried hard to control herself and keep calm. But when she saw that Karna was about to start a fight with Arjuna, a fight that could certainly result in the death of one of her sons, she couldn't take it anymore. Her head started to spin and she fell off her seat unconscious. The royal maids and nurses rushed in to help her. With their help, Kunti was soon able to regain her consciousness. I'm all right, I'm all right. It must have been the heat, she said, and went back to her seat to see what was going on in the arena. Meanwhile in the arena, the duel between Arjuna and Karna was about to begin. As per the rules of the game, Kripa, Arjuna's previous teacher, stepped into the arena to introduce the duelists. He first introduced Arjuna, giving the details of his glorious ancestry and lineage. Then he asked Karna to announce his lineage. Karna, please tell us about your lineage. Whose son are you? Which kingdom do you hail from? But Karna was silent. He looked quite embarrassed. From his attitude, it became quite evident that Karna was not of royal origin. But Kripa asked again, Karna, you must be aware that duels can only be fought between equals. So please, tell us who you are and which noble heritage you come from. Else we cannot permit you to fight with the Kuru Prince Arjuna. Karna felt deeply humiliated. As he was about to step out of the arena, Duryodhana came forward and said, Kripacharya, a hero's nobility is expressed only through his power and heroism and not by his birth. Karna has already demonstrated that his capabilities are no less than Arjuna and that alone should be enough to prove his credibility. However, if it is royalty you seek in Arjuna's contender, then so be it. Here, right now, in front of the entire Hastinapur, I proclaim Karna as the king of the state of Anga. He then called the Brahmin priests and right there in the middle of the arena, in front of the thousands of people, he crowned Karna as the ruler of the kingdom of Anga. Karna was overwhelmed with emotion. With folded arms, he asked Duryodhana, How can I ever repay you? Duryodhana held his arms and said, I only desire your friendship, dear Karna, nothing else. With the question of Karna's royalty being resolved, the duel with Arjuna was about to start again. As the two fighters got ready to fight, an old man walked into the arena. He was wearing a simple common man's clothes and carried a charioteer's staff in his hand. But the moment Karna saw this old man, he stepped down from his plate and bowed down to his feet. Here is my father, Adhiratha, Karna said to Duryodhana, who was curious to know who this man was. My father had adopted me when I was a small child. Then he turned to Adhirata and said, Father, thanks to my dear friend Prince Duryodhana, your son Karna is now a king. Adhirata was not able to control his emotion and tears rolled down his cheeks while he embraced his son and blessed him by kissing his forehead multiple times. He has been watching the crowning ceremony of his son Karna from the stands and couldn't hold back anymore. He had to come down to greet his son. In the sidelines, however, the Pandavas were laughing at Karna and his father Adhirata. Bhim jeered at Karna. Hey Karna, I think it's better you go back to running chariots. Huh? A son of a charioteer does not belong here and does not deserve the death in the hands of Arjuna. Karna felt deeply hurt at these insults. But he didn't say a single word in front of his father. But Duryodhana lashed back at Bhima. Shut up, you moron! Don't you dare insult my friend Karna. His birth may be mysterious, but no one should have any doubts about his heroism. Besides, who are you to question him about his birth? We all know very well that neither you nor your brothers are Kuru by birth. So what gives you the right to question Karna of his birth? Soon, a verbal warfare broke out between the Pandavas and the Kauravas, each hurling the choicest of insults at each other. The crowd too went wild and soon the verbal fight was about to turn into an all-out war. 
but by then the sun was about to set in the western horizon and Drona blew his conch shell to announce the formal conclusion of the day's proceedings. Kunti sighed in relief as Karna left the arena holding his father Adirat's hand and his new friend Duryodhana by his side. The crowd gradually left the stadium discussing about the day's events and speculating about the future of Hastinapur and the Kuru dynasty. The Stories of Mahabharata is written, directed and told by Shudipta Bomek. Audio engineering, original music and sound design by Avi Ziv. Find us online at facebook.com slash Mahabharata podcast. Join the group for updates and news. Subscribe to the podcast using iTunes or any other podcast catcher. On Twitter, we are at Mahabharata Audio. The podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons non-commercial license.